guys, I'm TT and I'm Beck, and we're what the kids call woke or whatever. whatever. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey. I say it, I mean it, you mad, but I'm speaking facts though. I got it, she got me, she mine. Baby, we on our own. My princess, my queen, oh my god, she make me feel at home. My element, pocket, my bag. Baby, I'm in my zone. They woke or whatever, they woke or whatever. 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 Hey guys, I'm TT and I'm Beck and we're what the kids call woke, woke or whatever. So, bonjour mon ange. Hi, mon amour, ça, ça va? va? <laughs> <laughs> Je voulais pas commencer sans dire bonjour. Ok, so, honnêtement, guys, on n'était pas supposé, on avait aucunement l'intention d'enregistrer un épisode avant 2024. Euh, C'était le plan. Donc à chaque fois que vous nous avez vu dans la rue, vous étiez comme, ah, c'est quand l'épisode? Il fallait être comme, ouais, soon. It was a lie. It's a... On n'avait pas, vra... on a vraiment pas l'intention d'enregistrer avant 2024. Euh, Petit et moi, on s'est entendu pour dire que la prochaine fois qu'on serait derrière un micro, c'est parce qu'on aurait quelque chose de substantiel à dire. Donc, la raison pour laquelle on est là aujourd'hui, c'est parce que, pas nécessairement qu'on a quelque chose de substantiel à dire, mais crucial à faire. Et c'est euh, d'adresser le génocide qui se passe présentement en Palestine. Et avant de commencer, je voulais juste... Euh, mettre au clair que la plateforme de Woke Whatever est en solidarité avec Palestine. Euh, on supporte euh, les Palestiniens dans leur euh, combat pour la libération. On est en solidarité avec eux et euh, sans hésitation, sans condition non plus. Um, whatever they feel the best way to do it, we're right on. And it's been free Palestine here. It's been... It's been free Palestine up in here. Um, c'est pas notre premier épisode sur la Palestine, c'est notre deuxième. Fait que si t'as pas écouté le premier, écoute, c'est still disponible. Et on a l'honneur d'avoir avec nous une palestinienne euh, écrivaine, auteure, euh, qui était là avec nous la dernière fois puis qui nous a fait vraiment grâce de revenir euh, sur la plateforme. Sama. Bonjour. Allô. Salut. Salut les filles, merci de m'avoir. Thanks for having me. On est vraiment content de t'avoir aujourd'hui. Est... Pour de vrai, je suis vraiment, vraiment grateful. Euh, C'était vraiment sur un coup de tête qu'on a décidé d'enregistrer. De, pas sur un coup de tête dans le sens où on n'y a pas pensé, mais encore une fois, on n'avait pas l'intention d'enregistrer. Mais pour nous, euh, après mûre réflexion de comme qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire, est-ce qu'on veut écrire un thread, est-ce qu'on veut genre faire un post. Euh, Mind you, ça fait six mois qu'on n'a pas pousse rien sur cette page. Um, on a décidé que comme c'est impossible qu'on ait une plateforme, la plateforme qu'on a, puis qu'on n'en parle pas. Surtout que encore une fois, à Montréal, Québec, je ne trouve pas qu'il y a tant la discussion. Fait que merci d'être là, vraiment. Merci d'être avec nous. C'est un plaisir d'être ici. Um, honestly, I was waiting for the both of you specifically to ask me to come on. No, oh, no way! <laughs> No, 100% because um, I'll be honest with you, I was approached by a bunch of different news outlets and like um, world recognized news outlets. And I said no to each and every one of them because I knew that their intentions were not um, pure. And last time when I saw you ladies, you were very open and honest with the conversation. You were very uh, clear about, like you said, you've been free Palestine and it's like the intention behind it was always good. So I was just waiting on y'all to say, like, oh my come on the podcast, and I'm glad you did. We're so glad you agreed, because honestly, the conversation was so quick. It was like, what do we do? Should we record? Let's record. Should we get Sama? Let's get Sama. <laughs> like, it was, like, so quick. And for us, we were, because you've been so active on social media, um, giving people updates on what's happening. Um, you have family in Gaza. We're going to get into all of that. But this is obviously something that's affecting you personally as a Palestinian. So for us, we're so honored that you took time out of your day to come because there's so many other things that you could be doing. You have to, I'm, I'm assuming, be glued to your phone to see what the next update is. So the fact that you're taking a couple hours out of your day to just focus on this, we're incredibly honored. We were not even sure you were going to say yes. And it would be totally understandable if you didn't. So, Well, you know, like how Beck just said in the beginning, like she was thinking about what can we do? We have a platform. Yeah. Like, that's exactly what I'm thinking. You know, yeah. like, What can I do here being a Palestinian that's not in Palestine, in Gaza right now? How, how can I help? With what I know and my experience, hopefully what I share, that's how I can help. 
Yeah. And, you know, speaking to my family back in Gaza, they always tell me the first thing is that you have to speak out, continue speaking out. So that's why I'm here. Yeah. That's why I'm here. We're, we're so grateful. And I know that the people um, in Gaza are also going to be grateful for your voice being spread because you're doing a lot. You're, you've it's, been doing a lot. It's honestly, it's my duty. Yeah. 100 and 150. It's like the bare minimum. Anything, like nothing matters to me more right now than the liberation of my people, than the safety and the survival of my people. Yeah. Doing this right now for me is the bare minimum. And again, um, thank you for having me on. It's, it's honestly, it's it's our duty. Yeah. It's our duty. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. So we're going to kick start with the first question for you. So October 7th is the date that a lot of people are going back to. Um, It's the date where, according to Western government, a terrorist group called um, Hamas, again, according to Western government, a terrorist group called Hamas attacked Israel, um, therefore leading us to the situation that is currently happening. So can you tell us from your perspective as a Palestinian that is living in Canada, but that also has family that lives in the Gaza Strip. Um, what was October 7th like for you? Did you think, did you find it confusing? Was it scary? Did you at that moment grasp that something major was happening or about to happen? Or was it just a normal day uh, for Palestinians? How did you f- see that day for you? Definitely wasn't a normal day. Okay. Um, I guess I'll walk you through it. I woke up, I was scrolling through my phone I opened up Twitter and like the first thing I saw was uh, a Twitter space that was like live, like, and it was in big bold, like it said, Hamas attack. And I was like, what the hell is this? So I clicked on it. I didn't recognize who was hosting it. I wasn't sure. Like the people were talking about something happened. Uh, They broke through. That's what I heard. Like they broke through. But I wasn't familiar with the people who were hosting the space. And Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't familiar, I took it kind of with a grain of salt because I know a lot of Palestinian peers and, uh, you know, organizers and stuff. I'm like, let me go check and see what's going on before I just see like how much. Assume, yeah. Yeah, but I was like, obviously something is big because it was like early in the morning. It was live. I was like, what's going on? Yeah. Um, I asked around. I started reading a bit more. And then I heard that um, they breached the fence. They breached the fence between Gaza and Israel. And when I heard that, and then after a photo came out of, like, the bulldozer going through the fence, like, my immediate thought was pride. I was like, oh, my God, like, we're fighting back. Like, oh, they're actually breaking out of this prison that's been imposed on them for how many, almost two decades. Um, So my first initial thought was pride when I saw that, mixed with an immediate sense of fear at the retaliation that would happen from um, the Zionist state of Israel. So that's kind of how it all started. Uh, Confusion, for sure. Pride, definitely. Fear, of course. (laughs) I've been holding my breath (laughs) since then, I think. Um, And then after that, when the media caught wind of it, that's when the lies started. Yeah. And they've been going on ever since. So you feared, like, initially, like, obviously, like you said, you were filled with pride, but you had this fear of, of oh, the retaliation is going to be, is going to be. Is going to be beyond. Yeah, wh- what you knew at that point. I had a feeling because um, it's one thing, because here's the thing, like, uh, Hamas has done uh, operations like this before in the sense that they will take uh, military hostages, like soldiers, mm-hmm. in exchange and, and as a negotiation tactic to try to exchange them mm-hmm. with Palestinian prisoners. Okay. So oh. so that's like their their bargaining chick. They'll take a soldier and they'll be like, "We'll release the soldier if you l- release a thousand of our of our pol- political prisoners." Oh. And the reason why is most of these Palestinian prisoners are held. Uh, through administrative detention, which we talked about last time I was yeah. here. And if you need a refresher for the audience, it's basically holding somebody without any charge or trial or mm. indefinitely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's literally baked into the Israeli system. It's legal to do that. Mm-hmm. So there are people who have been there for 5, 10, 15 years with no charge, imprisoned. No trial. Just there. No trial. Just yeah. there. Oh, yeah, waiting. wasting away. Yeah. So no trial, no case, no nothing. Oh. And uh, so I thought when I first heard of it, I thought that's what it was that they were taking hostages uh, in exchange for political prisoners, and that is the case. But of course, since then, it's kind of it escalated. Of escalated course. in tremendous ways. Mm-hmm. Yes. Do you think 
was it a bigger operation than it used to be? Because si ils ont l'habitude de le faire, puis que c'est pas qu'ils ont l'habitude, c'est pas genre régulier, ouais, mais c'est arrivé dans le passé. Déjà arrivé. Yeah, it's happened, yeah. Si c'est déjà arrivé dans mm. le passé, um, puis t'es comme ok, peut-être c'est la même le même genre d'opération. Est-ce mm-hmm. que tu sais qu'est-ce que, qui fait que cette fois-ci, it was different? Because in the past, at least from my knowledge, it was one, two. Uh, soldiers, you know, not an entire operation where they went and they, they took like 100 or 150 or whatever. Okay. So people, and to actually breach and go into um, is, well, Israeli occupied Palestinian territory, um, that is unheard of. At this, at that scale, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it was, it was not, uh, okay. at least to my knowledge, it wasn't seen before, which is why I knew that the fact that they were able to successfully do it I mean, the embarrassment that that causes to somebody like the Zionist regime, of course, they were going to retaliate in a way that would be, I mean, you see it. Mm-hmm. You, you can see it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I want to get into the state of Israel in the sense that um, more than a million Palestinian, so since October 7th, mm-hmm. more than a million Palestinian have has been, they have been displaced. Um, and since the end, bombing um but it's not the first time that I, they have been displaced and one uh thing that uh come back a lot is uh napka that happened in nakba that happened in 1948 yeah. that was like, the big um displacement and after that like the state of israel was official like mm-hmm. palestine was now like israel mm-hmm. um can you talk about the the event because i think people are confused as of like why we are not not we're against but like why the state of israel mean violence for the palestinian like the existence mm-hmm. of israel is not just like um oh they, it's two population that are at war or mm-hmm. it's a conflict or none of that but it's really like the state of israel um mean for the Palestinian that they're going to be displaced or they're going to be abused or they're going to be attacked in any way. So just like talking about Nagba, um, the event specifically. Sure, uh, I could do that. Um, so the Nakba, it's an Arabic word for catastrophe. That's what it means. Uh, oh, okay. It's our catastrophe. Um, both of my parents are survivors of the Nakba. They were toddlers, babies, when it happened. Um, In 1948, they say 750,000. I think that's a conservative estimate. But over 750,000 Palestinians were forcibly removed from their land and expelled and made to flee and never return. So to make way for a new population of settlers who at that time came from Europe. That's what it was. So imagine living on your land for generations, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and then a population came in and said, you have to leave, we are taking over this land. If you don't leave, we'll kill you. So that's what happened. 750,000 Palestinians packed up their things and had to find somewhere to go. My parents, my my parents' families were from Yaffa, the city of Yaffa, which today people know as Tel Aviv. Oh. But Tel Aviv was Yaffa, and my parents and, you know, my grandparents, like the family, they had to leave and they escaped south into Gaza. Mm. A lot of Palestinians escaped either in Gaza or the West Bank. I have to remind people these are two separate places. And they've been there ever since, in Gaza. So already in Gaza, it's like the biggest revu- uh, Palestinian refugee population is already in Gaza. It's already a refugee camp for a lot of Palestinians. A lot of Palestinians are not from the city, from Gaza. Mm-hmm. They're from other parts of Palestine that have been taken over in 1948 during the Nakba. So, um, yeah, that's what happened in 1948. And this plan of this creation of this state has been um, 
in the works for like 70, 80 years before that. Okay. So, yeah. Mais c'est vraiment, c'est vraiment similaire à like what's happening right now. Comme lire sur Nagba was like not surprising, but I'm like it's exactly what's happening in the sense like quand on demande aux Palestiniens de se déplacer, if you don't go, we're gonna bomb the place. Ah, je pense que à Nagba il y a genre il y a environ 500 villages qui ont été um, Palestiniens qui ont été rasés. Mm -hmm. And it's the fact that it's really like the same thing is happening. Yeah, j'ai vu beaucoup de Personnes disent, like, Nagba never ended. It didn't. Parce que les Palestiniens sont toujours en train d'être, like, forcibly being displaced, forcibly being, like, threatened, and then, like, you have to go, you have to flee. Like, on, like chaque jour, on voit le. Oh, les Israéliens nous ont dit, like, de go south, go south, go south. And, mm. like, they, they do, and then it's like, go further south. Et il y a aussi, il n'y a même pas de. And then that road is bombed. Well, right? exactly. Mm, it's like, it's that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the safety is not like, go south, we're going to wait. Like, no, no. three days, no. that, and you can just go. No, no, no. Yeah. it's completely... Uh, no, the Nakba has been ongoing since. Um, right, what's happening right now is the biggest displa displacement. It's even more than the Nakba. We okay. said 750,000 in mm -hmm. 1948. Now it's 1.4 million are displaced in Gaza. Um So it's even, it's a second Nakba. That's what Palestinians have been saying. But when we say the Nakba is ongoing, it's because since 1948, they've been taking more and more and more and more mm. land. It's not like they just stopped in mm. 1948. They literally have been taking more land um, illegally. And not. And I have to say, it's not just from Palestine. Like they have taken land from uh, Syria. They attempt to take land from Lebanon, like the Golan Heights. Like this is occupied territory. And the plan for Israel is to expand into those territories. They're not going to stop with Gaza. They're not going to stop with Palestine. They're going to continue and continue and continue with the backing of uh, the U.S. Mm. Yeah. And uh, they will tell you, go south, but they'll bomb the way there. And once you are south, they'll bomb it too. The plan all along has been to take control of Gaza and get rid of the people there. That's the plan. Um, before this month, I wasn't familiar with Hamas. I don't know if you were. You were no, not, not either. I was not. Um, but in the last few weeks, we've heard a lot about them mm -hmm. without really knowing what they are. Um, according to the West, they're a terrorist group. But um, I've done research on it. And to be honest, guys, like the audience, this information is very accessible. This information is incredibly accessible. It's a couple clicks away and you fully understand what these organizations are. So um, somehow feel free to jump in at any time and like mm -hmm. add, obviously. Um, so Hamas was founded by activist um, and Imam Ahmed Yassin in 1987 in Palestine after the first intifada against Israel. So Intifada is an Arabic word, and in the Palestinian context, it means like an uprising, resistance movement, um, basically a series of protests. So after the first Intifada against Israel, Hamas was created. So this uprising happened around like the 20 year anniversary of um, Israel winning the Six Day War in 1967. Um, and them winning the war meant that they were able to now capture the West Bank, Jerusalem, Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip. So after the Six Day War in 1967, a lot of uh, Palestinians that were living in Israeli occupied territory um, became incredibly frustrated. When it came to work, Palestinians were forced into like the unskilled labor that Israelis didn't want mm -hmm. to the point where by the first intifada, more than 40 percent of the Palestinians worked um, in Israel, um, were forced to work in Israel. So um, there were high birth rates that were in Gaza um, and the West Bank but at the same time, limited access to land, infrastructure, agriculture, population was growing, and employment rates was growing as well, to the point where by 1987, only one in eight college-educated Palestinian could actually do work related to a degree. So it's everything was um, was pretty messed up. So in 1987, Ahmed Yassin founded Hamas. And um, in 1993, the, letter, uh, the letters of mutual recognition were exchanged between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, So um, the Palestinian leader 
of the head uh, and head of the party, Fatah, um, and the prime minister at the time signed, exchanged those letters, and Fatah agreed to renouncing the use of terrorism and other acts of violence and recognizing Israel in pursuit of a two-state solution. But Hamas was not about that. Like hell, hell the hell no. Yeah, Hamas <laughs> the was fuck? like, yeah, no, no we're yeah. not gonna do that. They were completely opposed to the letters and the agreement. Um, so they continued to push and advocate for Palestinian armed resistance, which eventually led them to win the 2006 legislative elections, allowing them to govern the Gaza Strip, which was previously go- governed by Fatah. Um, again, the group that signed those letters and agreed to um, essentially being peaceful. Mm-hmm. So state solution. Yeah, it's not like they, it's not like Hamas didn't want peace. It's more like they didn't want to capitulate to every single demand that Israel will give. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people consider what Hamas is doing as simply being violent retribution that is inevitable. Um, it's important to note that although it is an Islamic resistance movement again, uh, governing the Gaza Strip. Gaza is still under Israel's control because I feel like a lot of people get this wrong and they feel like Hamas has control, like military this and that over mm-hmm. is over Gaza, but they really don't. It's because also the way the, the media is talking about it because it's always Hamas run. Yeah. Like, to, to like, uh, oh yeah. Hamas run I'm glad that you noticed Hamas that. Run. Yeah. It's cool. But it's but like they don't run them. anything. And <laughs> well, let me explain. Yeah. Okay. So Hamas like um, formally was founded in 1987, but they existed. Like before that, mm-hmm. it's just that after the Intifada, they decided to formally like mm-hmm. become Hamas and have a charter, and all of that. Um, the armed wing, they, there's two wings. There is the military wing, but there's also the so- social service wing. Mm-hmm. So um, they do um, like the social services, like the hospitals and like uh, things like that. They have some. Um, governance over it Mm -hmm. before they became Hamas like in the 80s and stuff they were doing (laughs) they were like the Black Panther Party in a sense where Mm. they were looking into uh, how to help their own societies by doing uh, different drives different uh, uh, like uh, how do you say like uh, food food banks for for, uh, orphans and things like that and as frustration grew more and more within the Palestinian population up until the Intifada, and it erupted. By the way, that erupted in a refugee camp. Yeah. In a refugee camp that's the same refugee camp that they bombed like two, three days ago. Mm. Jabalia refugee yeah. camp. Yeah. Um, so after that, they saw the need for the armed resistance to fight against the Zionists that were coming into the refugee camps and killing these protesters who were sick and fed up. Mm. And so once 1993 came on, came came about, and the Oslo Accords, this is what they call, and 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 they said, oh, two state solution, blah blah. They're like, what are you talking about? We yeah. are fighting for our liberation. We are fighting for the liberation of all Palestinian people, uh, including uh, West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza Strip, all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why when the elections came about in 2005, and it was between Fatah, I was like, okay, two state solution, and no, we want liberation. Who do you think would win? Yeah. Hamas, of course, yeah. won by a landslide. And this really upset the U.S. and Israel because they were banking on Fatah to win. Mm. They wanted the house n- to win. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I don't want to say the word the house and words to win because yeah. they wanted somebody who just went along with anything. Yeah, And that didn't happen. And once that happened, what they did was they decided to retreat from Gaza completely. Fatah completely re- retreated from Gaza and they um, designated Hamas as a terrorist group because mm-hmm. uh, they didn't start off. It's not like Hamas was founded and they became a terrorist group. They decided to put them as a terrorist group in the late 90s when they saw that they were rising in their popularity and that the armed resistance was also part of their um, the way they functioned, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so... All that to say that once that happened and they were elected, a blockade was put on them to ensure that they wouldn't succeed. Um, And since then, it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And the Hamas that started in 1987 is not the Hamas that exists in 2023. It's not the same members. The kids that were bombed their whole life since 2008, 
2006, 2008, 2014, 2000, how many times has Gaza been bombed? Those kids grew up needing the liberation, living for this liberation, knowing that they what, they're the only ones who will liberate themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're going to join a resistance that tells them that th with us, there might be a chance, a sliver of a chance of finding that liberation for yourself, for your family, for your people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I find it so interesting to compare this to the Black Panthers because I that's exactly what I was thinking when I was doing my research on the on Hamas because that's how the West described the Black Panthers as well when initially they did the 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 boycotts and they did the sit-ins and then eventually when that didn't work they had to resort to armed resistance and that's and from what you're explaining to me Hamas also did that in the beginning you know the the all of that and then eventually you have to you have to protect yourself and a lot of people a lot of a lot of people that are not swayed by what the west says believe that if it wasn't for Hamas there would be no Palestinian land left today mm -hmm. so um for you how has it been to see how the west has weaponized um, Hamas to justify the collective massacre of the Palestinian people? I think it's uh, straight out of the imperialist playbook. I'm not surprised at all. Um, the West, they love to demonize the resistance group. They love to demonize the liberation group because they go. it goes against their best interests. Um, I think more and more people are starting to understand the uh, propaganda that's been that's being uh, spewed by the media and how even they're confused. Hamas, Palestinians, we don't even know collective politics. I think like even the media doesn't even know what the hell they're saying anymore because they they're being fed an agenda. I think, and um, they're being told. Pretend like you care about the difference between Hamas and Palestine, but Palestinians, but not really. And uh, for me, it's dehumanizing, for sure, to see what the West is doing. But again, it's completely unsur unsur uns oh my God, I'm losing my words. <laughs> Unsurprising because they've done it before. Yeah. They did it in 2001 after 9/11. Um, if you're old enough to remember, uh, you know, like they, the first thing they did was dehumanize uh, Muslims and people from Afghanistan were no longer people from Afghanistan. When, when they attacked, those people became insurgents. And when they were talking about who are you, like 20 insurgents died today and you're like, OK, you re didn't really understand. But really, it was just Afghani people. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing. They say, like, oh, we killed Hamas people. But it's just like. They don't differentiate. I'm telling you right now, Israel does not give a crap about whether it targets Hamas or Palestinians or, or women or children or it doesn't matter. Their goal is to take control of the land and get rid of as many Palestinians as possible. I have a question, but I don't know. I've read... J'aime pas lire quelque chose de non puis like, il est pas décortiqué. Mais que, oh, okay. at some point, when we talk about the, the history of Hamas, mm -hmm. like, it says, like, Israel, like, Israel, like, funded Hamas, but I don't know if it, they funded them, like, as a government, come see as, like, an umbrella of, like, Israel govern all of Gaza. And, I'm not, or, or honestly, like, not. I'm not 100% sure, but okay. people, I have, I've been hearing the myth that, like, Israel created Hamas. Yes. That, that's No, that's not accurate. However, they did allow uh, Hamas to slowly grow in the ranks mm. and get funding and kind of let them do their thing um, and turn the blind eye on. Okay. Because Israel has enough, I think, um, surveillance, at least they claim, to know what is happening and at least to have some degree of resistance movements that are growing within the region. So I think what they did is uh, turn an eye, a blind eye. Okay. Je pense que c'est vraiment important à clarifier parce que people say so many things. Mm -hmm. Comme I think uh, comme it's really nice que genre everybody feel the need to mobilize. Mais j'ai entendu tellement de Hamas were created by Israel. So then mm. they did... The, I'm like... No. Puis aussi, I feel like it's, ça enlève une certaine 
une certaine euh, agency to yes. Palestinian. Thank you for saying Comme that. Comme si, genre, like, they, they cannot, like, they've been resisting. C'est pas parce mm -hmm. que we started caring two weeks ago que, like, <laughs> Palestinians just did nothing for, like, yeah. All for the, the last previous. 75 years, <laughs> they were just waiting existing. for us. Yeah. Tu sais, le fait que, the fact that we know that, tu sais, que les gens can call bullshit on, like, our government, it's because of people in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Like, it's because they're there filming, they're there, like, everything. telling their stories, like, les journalistes and everything, because they're there that we know. Even me, as someone qui a toujours été on some, like, I don't trust the media, I, tr I don't trust the government. Come, they lie a lot. Like, yeah. they lie a lot. Je, mm -hmm. pas que je pas consciente que they were not... Oh, wow. Tout le monde est comme, oh, les politiciens, moi, je comme, they just lie. But so, it's <laughs> very clear now how much <laughs> they lie. And I'm kind, they're kind of telling on themselves, to be honest, because it's like, is that bad? Like, whoa. Like, <laughs> I, knew, I knew it was bad, but is that bad? Like, yeah. Okay. Like, shit. Well, damn, all right. C'est rendu que comme, if I see any headlines... And it's in the watch. Come, you're lying. You're come lying. <laughs> like, who are you protecting? Whose interests are you saying this for? Like, whose pockets are you lining? Whose business? Who are you making richer? And it's so hard to fact check too. Mm. So come, mm. whoa! Like your sources are wrong too. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Like the 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 le, le, la rumeur de, of like forty beheaded babies. Mm -hmm. Stay. Like, it went so fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Started by journalist Bell True and also perpetrated by CNN reporter Sarah Sinner. I will <laughs> never, ever, ever let them forget this lie that they perpetrated. Absolutely disgusting. Again, their name, Bell True and Sarah Sinner. Both of you have blood on your hands. I hope you never get a moment's peace. Merci. Let's go. I approve that Amen. message. Parce que, au fait, juste, et que ce soit allé jusqu'au President Biden, and that he says it, like, and I saw the picture. Saw it. Where's he says? They come. Okay, y'all, <laughs> it's, it's the fact that <laughs> I never, je pensais que j'étais, I thought that I was, like, aware as, comme à quel point on nous montait, but I was not. And again, it's really shout out to, like, the people in Gaza. Now I'm just like, oh, y'all just, Mm -hmm. Y'all just I mean, we're it. getting a masterclass in deception and like just mm. how far, how stupid they think we are. Like we can't, like we don't have social media. It's like they forgot that between 9-11 and 2023, like the internet happened and like yeah. social media happened and people are able to report on their own and they yeah. don't need to go through the CNNs and the BBCs and all of them anymore. So yeah, I've been so disgusted. I've been so disgusted by the media. Mm. Mm. So disgusted, yeah. honestly. Like, I'm. I want to call them out. Like, I want to go, call oh, them. Go, go crazy. No, because I always knew it was bad. Like, like you, you know. But, but like this is really have. It's been clear to me now that there is no such thing as a proper journalist here in the West. They are all just glorified stenographers. All they do is just hear something and type it. And don't even ch fact check it. Don't even uh, check the sources. Don't yeah. and just bleh, vomit it back up yeah. to the audience. That's what's happening right now. And I'm saying this about literally every single mainstream news organization in Canada, in the United, United States, the UK, all of them, mm -hmm. from Global, CTV, CBC, uh, l'agence QME, <laughs> like uh, TVA, Radio Canada. Uh, All of them, uh, New York Times, the LA Times, uh, the BBC, uh, CNN, again, my God, CNN. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> like all of them. Mm -hmm. They all have blood on their hands and they, uh, like it's, it's unconscionable the, how many, how, how much they breached in terms of ethics in, when it comes to journalism. I honestly, um, I hope there is a legal recourse mm -hmm. to go after all of these organizations that have completely lied, flat out lied about what's happening, completely dehumanized an entire people and facilitated our genocide for what? For a paycheck? Mm. For status? For an award of excellence? Of what? For shame. Honestly, shame on you. Mm. You are allowing an entire 
group of people to be killed because you're scared of your job? <laughs> okay. No, thank you for that because no, they need to be called out yeah. and it needs to be documented. Like It is. And, I see, it like and there are a lot of Palestinians who are documenting every single journalist, every single literary organization that bolstered itself on being diverse and inclusive and we yep. we are the ones that bullshit yeah. when it came time to actually speak about it when it when you saw s uh, people actually trying to decolonize themselves not just talk about decolonization but actually attempt to do it for themselves putting action to their words and suddenly you have nothing to say to me that's cowardly to me that shows your true colors to me that means you're a mouthpiece You're not a don't call yourself a journalist. Don't call yourself, uh, you know, a human rights activist. If you haven't said anything, if you haven't taken a side, if you haven't clearly said, I am pro-Palestinian, I'm against this genocide, I'm against the Zionist regime, then you, my friend, are no human rights advocate. Mm -hmm. You are not that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to specifically commend the incredible, incredible bravery of the real, the real journalists in Gaza right now who are reporting despite having threats, not knowing from one moment to the next if they're going to be alive, who have had their entire families targeted and murdered. And this is true. There's multiple reporters, and I'm specifically thinking of one man, Wael. His wife and his children were killed And the same day, he still went and he reported because he knew his duty and what he had to do and report the truth. These are the real people who, who are real heroes who are risking everything to say the truth for a chance at people to see them and see them as humans. So I commend them for the excellent reporting that they've been doing. And these are the people that are going to go down in history as the true, the bravest people and the bravest heroes and the true revolutionaries that all of these Western stenographers think they are. Mm. And that's all I'll say about that. No, thank you for thank that. Thank you for that. It was so necessary. Yeah. Um, and you said something, you talk about uh, Zionism. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking, and when we were talking about Nakba, you We're talking, you briefly mentioned uh, the ideology of Zionism. And I think that I really want to have this discussion because there's been, when people talk about the right to the land, they talking about like who's the native of the land of Palestine. And uh, when it comes to Jews, um, I think what people have in mind is the Israel in the Bible. And I know it as someone who grew up Christian of like, oh, this is the land of the Jews. But um, I think it's important to make the discussion, the distinction between Jews and Zionists mm -hmm. and that it's not the same thing and it's not, it, not every Jews are Zionist yeah. or agree with the ideology of Zionism. And what Zionism is basically is that uh, the belief that um, the Jews should have uh, a land to themselves um, and it appeared in the early 19th century so like when you said that it's been a while it's been a while like it was not in 1948 um, I feel like the way that we were taught uh, World War II it was like oh we feel bad for the Jews here's a piece of land mm -hmm. here's but it was an idea that an idea that has been um, forever. forever forever I mean if not forever but like It's no, but been since the it's, it's, mid eight, mid 19th century. Mid 19th yeah. century, and it's uh, a direct um, the the direct cause of anti semitism mm -hmm. because the Jews felt like oh, we want to go back to having our own land, and what's important to uh, know is that they try out different lands. So it was just not it was not like oh we know that Palestine is our land. It's like I think Uganda was one that they try out to see, mm, are we good here? Mm -hmm. No, maybe not. And Argentina like, was another yeah, one. Yeah, Argentina was one until they settled to Palestine 
Um, they were like, oh, we have rules there. We have history there. I think this is the land. And so for many, many years, they were like, they demanded that to have Palestine. And I think in uh, back in the day, it was under the Ottoman Empire. Mm-hmm. And every couple of years, like they were the more and more immigrant Jews uh, that came to Palestine. So mm-hmm. gradually, gradually there were more and more Jews. I think in the beginning, there's always been a diverse um, population of like a diverse religions. I in think Palestine? in Palestine, mm-hmm. Christian, Muslim. It was and always Jews. a major- majoritarily uh, Arab and Muslim. Mm-hmm. However, there was also a lot of Christians and Jews, and also Druze. Not Jews, but D R U Z E, which is something oh. else. <laughs> so there was a, um, yeah, definitely multi ethnic, multi religious uh, community in Palestine. Yeah. So, and then after, again, World War II, um, that's when the West decided to, okay, the Jews can go to Palestine. And it's not, again, it's not because they're kind. I don't know. I don't know if people think that it's just like, oh, we pity them. Out of them, the goodness of my of heart. Of the goodness. I, the, Britain, yeah, shall yeah, gift you the, the land. Not, <laughs> sure. They're not good. Yeah. <laughs> it's more on some who will help us like have a foot in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Like, How can we have a foot in the Middle East? And how like, can we get rid? Because the biggest anti-Semites are the Europeans. I'm sorry, but the Holocaust happened in Europe. Yeah. Um, they want it. I have a friend, uh, an indigenous Jewish friend. She told me something, and it really stuck with me. She said, um, Israel was created, and she's anti-Zionist, and she said Israel was created because Europe didn't want to deal with its anti-Semitism problem. It it literally, it just wanted to ship Jewish people off somewhere away from Europe so it becomes somebody else's problem. And that's why Israel was created. It wasn't a safe haven for them or anything like that. It was just for Europe to be like, okay, let's. how do we... How do we get rid yeah. of the... And yeah. when, um, you know, the British, uh, after the Ottoman Empire fell and the British took hold of, of that region, um, they thought, hey, we have this plan. We have this partition. Look, let's do it. Palestine, okay, let's let's give it to them. But it was never meant to be, um, like you said, like this benevolent gesture of let's give the Jewish people a safe homeland. That was, no. No. Mm-hmm. And you can see it just on the way that when, if a Jewish person op- like is in a position of Israel or like Zionism, they're being brutalized. So it's not on some, let's protect all Jews. It's really all that go. It's uh, us protect Zionists. Ex- Zionists, exactly. And many Zionists are not Jewish people. And like mm-hmm. you said, uh, political Zionism has nothing to do with the Jewish faith. Um, it was created as a way to, it's like, how can we have an ethno state that is majoritarily Jewish? How can we ensure that? And um, in order to do that, 1948 happened. They literally kicked out an entire ass population to become a majority. And the only way to keep keep a majority is to keep kicking people out, keep making the the land bigger. And the oppressor small, the the oppressed land smaller. So that's what they've been doing. Um, but yeah, so I don't know where I was going with this, but but no. um, it's just. And I think, je pense que qu'est-ce qui est vraiment intéressant dans intéressant. It's mm. the Brit right trip mm. that Jews have. So si tu es juif entre l'âge de 18 et 26 ans et that you never been to Israel before, it's like it's an ad. Like, come to Israel. Mm-hmm. Like, you have, like, a free trip. You can see how it is. It and was they... created by a businessman in, like, the 70s <laughs> or 80s, by the way. Oh, my God. And, yeah. they, and you can stay there. Like, you you can actually stay in Israel. I think it's interesting that all the conversations are like, who has the right to the land? Like you said, there are a lot of people that don't... Like, they're not... Like, they're, they're not... No, they're not from the land. It's just, like, you come from L.A., And you came. You came from L.A. and and your grandparents and great grandparents are are from like Europe. Yeah. And it's like. Because we know you're not actually from America, right? (laughs) Like you are European at the end of the day. Your parents settled in the United States. And then now all of a sudden you have 
a connection a, to Palestine or, or what you call a right Israel. To the land when Palestinians are being denied their right yeah. to return. But why do you think they keep trying to get people to go? We're like, we'll pay for you. Like they wanna they want people to settle. Mm. They want European people to go in and settle, which is why they pay for birthright trips. Like in nineteen forty eight, when 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 the state was created you couldn't pay a Jewish person to go to Israel. And this is for real. Like, like, actually, I think even before it was created, they were trying to incentivize Jewish people to go to Palestine. But Jewish people were not. They're like, no, I'm good. Like, out of why would I need to go? It was not a thing. Mm-hmm. But as uh, tension grew against Jewish people, the anti-Semitism grew in mm-hmm. really dangerous ways in um, Europe. Then there was a potential, oh, we could maybe scare them into going something, feeling like they need a homeland that is exclusively for them. So in the beginning, Jewish people did not have any interest. And there's even documented stories, again, like you said, Titi, a few clicks away, very verifiable. You can go check yourself. Um, Iraqi Jews, for example, had no interest in moving at Mm. all. And what happened is that the Israel, the Zionist um, I, IDF, like the, the the military, orchestrated bombings of Iraqi Jewish neighborhoods in Iraq, and accused Muslims of perpetrating it. And then they went on and told the Jewish people in Iraq, "You are only safe in Israel. Come to Israel." And there was a mass migration of. Uh, Iraqi Jews, and they settled in Israel. So these are tactics that were used by Zionists mm-hmm. against Jewish people. They killed Jewish people in those bombings to create this sense of fear that there's only one place in the world that's safe for you, but and that place is la propaganda. La propagation is good. Like the propaganda is good yeah. because même dans les rhétoriques que t'entends, the people are Jews and they're like, oh, but where are we going to be safe? And I'm like. Where is the threat? Like you, exactly, like, and you're so far away. Pas des gens qui sont en train de like you're so far away. Like why is the threat? So, c'est là que tu vois que comme la la propagande. It like, starts when they're when yeah. it's very like it starts early and it's constantly told. Oh, it's the only safe. It's the only safe place. But it takes just a m- bit of critical thinking to deconstruct that and be like, what does that mean that a Jewish person or a Christian person or a Muslim person is only safe in one little piece of land in mm. the world. Like, does that make sense? And how do you feel like as a Palestinian when people are like, I guess, questioning your, your indigeneity to the mm. land of Palestine that like, and they say like, oh, but Jewish people have this ancestry there. Like They do. Jewish people do have ancestry there. Mm-hmm. No Palestinian will deny that. It's the... It's it's actually Zionist people that deny that Palestinians ever existed. What we're mm-hmm. saying is that um, Palestinian Arabs, Palestinian Arab Muslims, Palestinian Arab Jews, Palestinian Arab Christian people, all these people lived in harmony mm-hmm. together in a society of multiple faiths and multiple ethnicities. Mm-hmm. There were Jewish people for sure in Palestine before Israel was created. Oh yeah, like no Palestinian would deny that. Um, we are all indigenous to the land. The people who have been cultivating and tending and loving the land for generations, generations, and thousands and thousands of years, those are the people who are indigenous to the land. Like, we've we've been tending it. The Zionists came in and have been destroying it ever since. Mm. That's how I know they're not indigenous. Mm. Because they come into the land and they destroy it. They fill up our wells with cement. They uproot our olive trees. They try to plant pine cones, <laughs> like European pine cones instead. It doesn't work, obviously. They have a really high rate of skin cancer. I like, saw that. I read about that. I was so fascinated. I'd never seen that before. Yeah. So excuse me, when I go to my homeland, I don't burn under the sun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's the truth. No. Um Benjamin Netanyahu, who is the prime minister of Israel, is someone who's been very, very vocal on his desire to eliminate Palestinians. Um, He's committed several war crimes under international law, and this was way before October 7th. Um, Again, it's really important to mention for our audience that October 7th is not the start of um, 
Gaza being targeted or is uh, Palestine being targeted? Um, we had an episode two years ago, literally, mm-hmm. with Sama talking about this. So clearly, it's been an ongoing thing. Um, every couple of years, there's going to be some sort of headline. Um, so we had so there was there was a lot going on two years ago. Prior to that, it was around 2014. So it's 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 way before uh, October 7th. Um, so again, President Netanyahu um, has been very vocal about his desire to exterminate Palestinians, but um, nothing seems to happen. He's been brought to, he's not been brought to court. He's able to escape accountability for years now. Um, knowing all of this, do you feel like it is fair for to question the purpose of national law? And do you believe that it's even possible for Palestinians to obtain any kind of justice through the law? No. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, the law was created by our oppressor. The entire system was created by our oppressor. So how can I think that it is through the legal system that will receive justice? I mean, when you think about how people in the West Bank, which is occupied and controlled by um, Israel, uh, already since I saw you two, two years ago and we are talking about Sheikh Jarrah at the time, people have tried to go through the courts to save their land and save mm-hmm. their homes. And, but it doesn't work mm. because it's literally, you're going to your oppressor and you're asking, hey, like you're, can you not oppress me maybe? Mm. <laughs> said, hey, like, according to, to your own rule. <laughs> yeah, according to your, it's literally the same as uh, the police investigating themselves. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's, it's the same thing. So I don't have any faith in the legal system ever freeing us. Mm. Like, no, Palestinians will free Palestinians. Like, we free ourselves. Like, that's what it is. I just don't think the law has ever been on our side. And even with things like International Criminal Court, I don't have faith in it. Um, The UN, what has the UN done? Like, I commend the the man who resigned, the people who are resigning from the UN and from these places that are saying enough is enough. But as institutions, I do not um, have faith in them. And like I say, the legal system is literally created by... our oppressor, and for our audience, I want to uh, them to understand that this is what institutional means. It is institutionalized racism. The entire system is created to keep us oppressed. Mm. Mais, okay. L'affaire avec international law, and it's, you know, the way que on a, we can collectively realize how much we were lied too Mm -hmm. with the press Mm -hmm. and like the politician and stuff I feel like it's a little harder with the law not that we have faith but when we want to critique um, uh, the Prime Prime Minister of Israel or like what's going on in in Palestine or was like it's a war crime, mm-hmm. like according to international law, according to da, da, da. and I, I think that's why people are feeling kind of hopeless because they're like, well, the law is there, the crime is there. What's happening? Come literally, what's what's happening? So it's like, like people are confused. Because there's pas there's pas cette realization de just the same way que come they're not telling the truth mm-hmm. with. Um, the press and the and the journalism is not done properly or ethically or nothing. It's the same thing with the law. Mm-hmm. The law is there f- to like to protect one side. See, exactly. see if that side decides that I don't feel like bringing myself to court. Are you gonna do it? Yeah, it, it's So I feel like see the we yapa la même chose. Y a collective maybe a collective realization about like politician and like the press and made the law I feel like just we're kind of attached to it like well, people hope that maybe he's gonna get to court and like be I hope that it nice. happens I hope that eventually they are all tried in in uh, international like criminal court and sent off yeah. but I mean like you said I, international law only applies mm-hmm. to a certain group of people and it look, those people look like us. They don't look like, you know, so. That is so true. Yeah. 
Um, so with the talking about politician, actually, um, during the during the everything that happened since like October seventh, we've seen the major leaders of uh, the, the I was like the, the major leader of society, but like of the biggest country, really clearly supporting Israel. A right to defend uh, itself. Um, Justin Trudeau first, actually. Um, one thing he's going to do is repeat that he <laughs> support Israel in his its right to defend itself, uh, despite the the big protests, the manifestation, like the, despite people saying no. Actually, despite the population saying, "I'm not down for my tax dollars to go mm -hmm. to support a genocide. I'm just not with it." Um, I just wanted to uh, know from your perspective, like seeing that, because the last time that you came, you said that it was your first time seeing so much people actually supporting Palestine mm -hmm. like you've never seen before. And I think we can agree that now it kind of grew. But despite, again, all of that, um, nothing is not nothing is moving, but we cannot... Like make Justin Trudeau like change his mind, or like he's gonna still keep repeating the same thing over and over again. So, I wanted um, to ask: Is it surprising for you, or did you like did you hope that maybe it would like have a turnover? As, and actually, it's not over. So, mm -hmm. do you think it, that it can happen, or you just like the way the same way that our perspective of the press change? your perspective of like dem, dem, what's a democracy mm. actually changed? That's a good question. Surprised? No. Disgusted? Yes. I think I'm more, um, the only surprising part is that it's, it's, they're so like, they have blinders on in a way that I've never seen before. Like they are really trying to <laughs> ignore very hard the public opinion. Um, in this way, maybe I've never seen that, but I'm not surprised because I understand that Justin Trudeau, again, he's a mouthpiece. All he's just waiting for instructions. He like whatever he truly believes <laughs> at night. You know, when he goes to bed, I don't, I don't know. But he's not a powerful person. He's waiting for instructions from genocide Joe Biden, and the political so-called leaders are another branch, uh, just like the media is, another branch of imperialism. All they do is look after their best interests, which is the interests of their shareholders, of their businesses, of their corporations, blah, blah, blah. That's all it is at the end of the day. And I think more and more I'm seeing just how clearly this so-called nation um, is just bought and sold. It's bought and sold just like the U.S. It's run like a business. They don't care about us. They don't care about public opinion. Um, what they do care about is money. It all literally goes down to money. And now that we're, we're like really showing them that we're not with this, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, we have to keep putting pressure, keep organizing, mobilizing, protesting, disrupting, like actually disrupting um, for them to pay attention. Because once they see that we're withholding not just our money, but um, our votes, because that's all they care about, um, then they might change their tune. And then again, don't believe them. It's just going to be as a way to placate you or placate the audience. Like, okay, now we understand. There really need, needs to be a humanitarian pause. <laughs> but we won't say ceasefire, but humanitarian pause. Like, you saw, I don't know if you saw that a couple of days ago. Like, Justin Trudeau, he, like, he, like stumbled yeah, over yeah, his he words. He's, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. he's, like, yeah, yeah. cease uh, humanitarian pause. We need to yeah. cease the violence. The, it's, like, uh, yeah, bro, really, like, it. it's... It's honestly, it's embarrassing. And it's just, to me, that just goes to show just how much they're puppets. Mm. And uh, they're just waiting for their commands. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, 
I mean, I never ha had much faith in the political system, but I still voted. I mean, I'll be real with you. I voted. I used to vote NDP. Me too. I think, I think um, right after Trump was elected and we had our election, that's the mm -hmm. one. And I'll admit it. I voted for Trudeau. I'll admit the, the shame I carry. But hey, I, because I did it out of fear. I did it out of fear because I didn't want a conservative Trump, blah, 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 blah. But now, yeah. yeah. All y'all can go to hell. Yeah. All y'all can go to hell. NDP included because NDP they, included. They, yeah. yes, because they fired about it. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. they fired a black disabled woman for saying that there should be a ceasefire. Like, are you kidding me right now? You, the party that is supposedly supposed to be the most progressive, are gonna do that because somebody exercised their right to say what they thought was true and what? The NDP. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So they have lost my vote. They've all lost my vote. That was a, but not a shock, but I'm like, oh, there's no, there's no, <laughs> there's not such thing as progressive. No. And I'm just We're like in you. The gutter. <laughs> and I'm just like you. <laughs> I've always voted. It's always been something like that I just do in our family. Like everybody goes to vote. Even as I became more and more aware of like how the system works, and I, Always, I don't. I didn't remember move it. No, I remember. No, I like I'll do it. You're like you know, you like yes, I did this. But I should go. But now, no, this. Oh yeah, like everybody's disgusting. Yeah, I'm. I was shocked by NDP though. I'm not gonna lie. I really was like, okay, they're gonna be the one party that's gonna like stand in solidarity. But with this, they showed me that they're the worst. They reminded me of Malcolm X and when he said the liberals, the liberals, be yeah. careful. They're worse. They're worse than the, the Republicans. Those who pro proclaim to be progressive, those who tell you that they're on your side. Be careful. Um, yo, yeah. yeah. We, we saw that. Yeah. Clear and, as day. And it's like you read it and you're like, yeah, you're right. But you never. <laughs> but for the vrai, ça, ça m'a vraiment fait comme, oh, you, vous êtes, everybody's aligned with the state. Like mm -hmm. everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like it's just like, it's, We've been actually living in a play. Like, everybody has their role. Okay, mm -hmm. you're progressive, you're conservative. Yeah. But when it comes to a population trying to, like, free themselves, everybody's conservative. Ils sont plus conservatifs que les conservatifs. Yeah, 100%. Like, really hard. Like, Joe Biden was... And not that I had faith in him, but the fact that, genre, they were more against the ceasefire than les républicains. I'm like, oh, it's just... It doesn't like, mean anything. It's the, one, it's the first time now, I think, with their polls that literally across all parties, they're like, we want a ceasefire. Like most, like even Republicans, which is like 50% or 50, yeah, like for 50, Republican, that's like, a lot. That is crazy. And they're still um, no. saying no because they know the plan. They know what they want to do. They want to ethnically cleanse Gaza and they're going to try it as much as possible to do it. What I think they don't, they didn't expect is to see such a public um, blowback or like um, response from it. And I think that is going to bite them in the ass in like a big, big way. And I think that like, like I mentioned all of the media, those channels and all of these politicians, like, ooh, I think there's going to be a day of reckoning for them. Like mm -hmm. they're going to... Yeah, it's not going to go, like, it's not going to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. It's not going to go, like, unpunished or unnoticed from the people. I think it's going to, they're going to realize how badly they messed up with this in due time. Yeah. I do believe so. Um, the discussion around Palestine has um, shed awareness on other genocides that are happening around the world, like the genocide in Congo and the genocide in Sudan. And in our last episode together, we talked about the undeniable link between the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, the fight to free Palestine. Um, if you don't know by now, Sama is an Afro-Palestinian. If you're listening, if you see you see the, you see the cornrows, you know, it's good. <laughs> Um, so in this episode, we, um, because we did link it to Black Lives Matter in our last episode, in this episode, we think it's really important to also highlight, uh, that the 
liberation of Palestine is directly linked to the liberation of all of the people in the global south. Um, so Palestine cannot be free if Sudan isn't free. Sudan cannot be free if Congo isn't free because they're all interconnected and these fights should be discussed at the same time because it all comes down to the same thing, which is imperialism. And that is what we should be attacking. So I wanted to discuss a little bit I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about the genocide in Congo and how it is linked to Palestine, because there are a lot of similarities that we're not aware of, um, which is why it's really important to to mention um, all genocides at once. So before we get into it, I just want to mention that this is in, in no way a deep dive into the Congolese genocide, uh, nor will it be a deep dive into the Sudanese uh, genocide, the war on Sudan. Um because when we do these deep dives, we want to make sure that we allocate the correct correct amount of time and also with guests that are from these respective countries. So what we're currently doing is really just uh, speaking on these genocides because we need to know that they're happening and also um, directly linking it to um, the common denominator, which is imperialism and, and explain how everything is interconnected. We will make sure to link um, the sources that we use in the articles. Um, however, we want to make sure that any deep dive is going to be done the correct way. So there is currently a very deadly genocide for power and control over eastern Congo, an area that is widely rich in minerals. Um, the M23, which is a rebel group, has been responsible for these killings, uh, dismemberment, sexual assault, um, displacement of thousands of Congolese adults and children. Um, the UN Refugee Agency states that the DRC uh is the most complex and long-standing humanitarian crisis in Africa, and it is home to the fourth largest group of internationally displaced people in the world. And just as of today, at least 6.9 million people have been displaced. So again, um, we're just we're already seeing like a common theme. This yeah. is usually what we see when it comes to genocide. And I'm glad you're bringing this up because I myself, admittedly, I don't know enough about what's going on yeah. in the Congo, and, and I have been reading a bit more. Um, in the last month, and you're right, the similarities are crazy, hard to miss. <laughs> yeah, no, it is, it is. So, like I mentioned, Congo is incredibly rich in minerals. So, the, uh, while also being one of the largest countries in Africa, however, it is also one of the most economically deprived countries. Um, Congo is one of the major mining countries of Africa, it's, and um, it's home to the largest reserves of metals and rare metal, minerals that are used to make electronics so whether it's cobalt or diamond or copper or gold and colton there it will be fine it will be found in congo and congo is very rich in these minerals and the key mineral that is found in congo is colton that is used to power technology mm -hmm. um and so a lot of modern day technology that we use whether it's iphones laptops all of that they they need colton and um the west has been exploiting Congo heavily for this Colton, which is why we're able to constantly have like iPhone releases back to back and all of these new products and all of that and mass producing them. It's because the West is exploiting Congo for its Colton. And um, people are working in very, very harsh conditions, very deadly conditions, a lot of times against their will to produce this Colton. Children as well. Children, literally children. Most minors, a lot of, uh, the majority of minors are children. A lot of them are children. Um, so... Uh, Congo was initially colonized by Belgium and it gained its independence in 1960. Um, and uh, Congo initially was taken under the control of King Leopold of Belgium in 1885 up until 1908. Um, and in 1908, he had to give away control to the country of Belgium because of the gross torture that was happening to the Congolese people to the point where they had they he couldn't be in control anymore. And just under his regime between 1885 and 1908, about 50 15 million people were murdered. 15 million Congolese people were murdered. And it's this thing that a lot of people believe that since when Belgium took over, the country of Belgium took over, that the mass massacre stopped and they were now peaceful and all of that. But that continued. That continued even past Congo's um, independence in 1960. Um, Congolese people have continuously been exploited um, for their rich minerals in the deadliest ways. So the M23, which is the rebel group that is actively murdering the Congolese people today, is made up of members from Rwanda, Uganda, and other neighboring countries, while politically powerful countries such as the Britain, mm. the US, France, China, and 
Israel. Mm, there you go. That's all benefit. They all benefit from this exploitation because they continue to extract the mineral uh, resources from Congo for their own profit. So all of these countries are 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 ex- are benefiting from this exploitation. And just to give you an overview of how much cotton the, Cong- the Congolese people are actually producing, just in 2021, Congo produced over 700 metric tons of cotton, and that's currently ongoing. Mm. And I just want to mention also mining cotton is incredibly hard. It's lab- laborious and a lot of people are risking their lives because the mines do collapse and there's no there's it's not there's no work safety measures yeah there's no work Mm -hmm. to make it safe for the workers a lot of these workers are children and on top of this labor they're being murdered senselessly senselessly by the m23 however it is really really important to mention that the blame is to be put on the most powerful and politically influential countries of the world we need to point our fingers towards them because Mm -hmm. It's the same culprits and all of these other genocides that are happening. And also, I'm curious to know, like, I don't know if you have the answer, but who funds this M23 group? You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's um, I'll actually I will get into that. You I'll I'll break that down a little bit for you. Okay. So um, many countries have, for example, criticized Rwandan, uh, Rwanda's involvement in M23. However, Britain is one of these countries that hasn't criticized. And then you can ask yourself, okay, why hasn't Britain criticized? Because the UK signed a migration and economic development partnership with Rwanda. Mm. So they're not going to, you know, criticize. And uh, so, yeah, so now uh, we need to be on these countries' throats because they, this is all being supported and pushed by them. Now, um, a Palestinian writer and activist actually spoke about this, spoke about um, what's happening in Congo and linked it to the genocide in Palestine by stating the following. So I'm just going to be um, reading what she said. So I want to point out that, in fact, Israel is at the heart of the genocide in the DRC. Israel has been arming and training militias in Rwanda and Uganda to maintain the violent chaos that facilitates Western mineral extractions from Congo's mine. Um, The M23 militia is the primary culprit for the devastation in the DRC. They've uh, received surveillance software, military hardware, funds and training from various Western states and especially Israel. Furthermore, Israel is not only cheered for the assassination of uh, Patrice Lumumba, the first democratically elected president of Congo, but they helped prevent bringing his murderers to justice. Israel helped maintain the horrifically oppressive rule of Mobutu Sese Seko for decades. A contingent of Israeli armed and trained paratroopers were the backbone of Mobutu's suppression throughout Congo. Dig deeper into any atrocity across Africa and you will find Israel. From the Rwandan genocide, Israeli armed arms dealers boasted about supplying weapons to the genocidal diamond extraction industry or any other extractions uh, extractives in Africa. So I, I, I found the last part interesting. I was like, oh, diamond extraction. Let me look into that a little bit. And it's really true. Israel, one of Israel's biggest export is diamonds. Mm -hmm. But fun fact, it's important to know that Israel does not have any diamond mines. So, but you know who do Congo. There you go. And I read this article called Israel's Dirty Trade in Africa, Diamonds, Weapons and Settlements. So it states Israel is considered one of the most important countries that import rough diamonds and the most prominent countries that export polished diamonds. Most of these diamonds come from African countries such as South Africa, Liberia, Congo, Ivory Coast, amongst others. These countries are directly linked to the groups committing massacres against civilians in order to obtain diamonds and trade with these diamonds. trades with these diamonds leads to the death of tens of thousands of people annually in these countries of origin. The sale and export of these diamonds are linked to major arms deals, the creation of civil wars, and financing the fighting groups. This has caused the diamond trade in Africa to be called the dirty trade. The jewels are called blood diamonds because the blood of thousands of Africans is shed in order to extract and market them. So again, we see the undeniable link. So that's why when we say in order for Congo to be free, Palestine needs to be free in order for Palestine. Like it's yeah. because it is this it is the same culprit. Isn't it crazy just yeah. how literally yeah. like you just scratch the surface and you see so many similarities and like even with what's happening in the Sudan as well like when um <laughs> When you see that there are military factions in the in the Sudan that are being 
funded or by so-called friends of Sudan, mm. which is a bunch of Western countries that say that call themselves the friend of Sudan, which are, are also at the same time supporting the military groups that are suppressing Sudanese people. That Sudanese are, people are saying, we do not want these military groups to, to, to be in power. So are you really friends of Sudan? Who are you friends with? Mm -hmm. Why are you calling yourself friends of Sudan? You're, you're, you're funding a group that Sudanese people don't want. Yeah, and it's so easy to call these countries like barbaric and like fighting against each other yeah. when the ultimate people that are causing this are the Western, yeah, um, imperialist, mm -hmm. U.S. led. It's really similar to Haiti because 100%. the 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 U.S. is trying to go back to Haiti right now. Oh yes. And so there was an occupation in 1915 to 1929, and then. Like, from there, there's always been, like, disturbance in Haiti. And, like, right now for a month, there's been, like, different gang group really, like, kidnapping people. And, like, um, the really the population has been, like, troubled. And recently it was, uh, it was, we learned that the weapon that these groups have are being sent through the R by the U.S., um, and yeah. now Biden is like, oh, we're gonna, we want to go to Haiti to help, but this it's always the <laughs> same yeah, story. In, yeah, but in Slovakia, it's all new, and that it uh, was helped. Good. Has the U.S. ever went anywhere and helped? Like for real, answer me this question. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't know. See, um, all the, all the, what we call the global south, mm -hmm. who come underdeveloped countries, every problems is always created by. Mm -hmm the u.s it's yeah, always yeah. u.s imperialism and then they're not underdeveloped they're they're de-developed de they're literally yes thank they you take yeah. it they extract the wealth they extract the resources and then they create like warfare between the different ethnic groups that are there they've been doing it for a very long time they destabilize the entire world because of it and they're doing it now i mean the u.s that's their business. I mentioned before, they run their country like a company. I meant that shit. They run their, their country like it's a business. Their biggest exports are weapons. So what are they going to keep? Their, how are they going to keep their business alive? How are they going to keep America alive? By selling as many weapons and uh, getting as much profit as possible. So they're going to try to destabilize as many regions as possible. And we need to, they need to sell those guns. They need to sell those bombs. They need to sell these new... Weapons that they, they, they're, they're using right now on my people in Gaza, white phosphorus bombs that I read today can only be filled in one company that is in like the States somewhere. So now we have a group that's mobilizing and they're going to try to go and shut down that place mm. so that they physically cannot send white phosphorus to Gaza mm. to use on our people. I think it's for that, you know, and all this money that is being made by the U.S., it's not coming back to the, to the Americans. People. Like, it's not like they have free health care. Yeah. It's not like the school is less. It's getting worse and it's worse. worse. It's yeah. getting worse. So it's like it come. They're going to unfreeze the student loan. They're literally, yeah. they froze it for a bit, the, the, like the student loans during the pandemic. And now they're like, we're going to bring it back up. Meanwhile, they're funding how many wars? Mm. Girl, you're, you're still giving money to Zelensky, like the Ukraine. Like, y'all forgot about the Ukraine. You're, yeah. you're still arming the Ukraine. Yeah. You're trying to get something started in Taiwan with China. Schools are you're, underfunded, dude. Like, and now you're doing this with Israel. Like, y'all are bloodthirsty. They don't care about anything yeah. but war and weapons and money and mm. how can we get it. But so me, forget education. Forget health It's the way that they can... Okay, ils peuvent débloquer de l'argent so easily. It's like, there's no, il n'y a pas yeah. d'argent pour le school, no for the hospital, nothing. Like, we can't fund. 14 yeah, like, milliards de dollars just like that. Just be, yeah, we want to help when they, are, when they already oui. get <laughs> 3. <laughs> 3. <laughs> 1, 4, a billion a year, they already get billions of dollars a year. And oh, we just, emergency, 14 billion dollars. Okay. In, the scam is real. Like, <laughs> this is a money laundering <laughs> scheme, like, à, à l'extrême. Et c'est pour ça que comme, <laughs> we want to, the audience to understand that's why it always concerns you. Come, mm -hmm. yeah, but it's not me, or it's not like it doesn't concern me. Like, not only it's your tax that goes to like kill 
Um, the Palestinian and just that should be enough. Mais c'est pas de l'argent qui te revient in any way. Like the the price of the groceries still going up. On rentre dans une récession. But like we have money for we always have money for war. Mm -hmm. We always have money to like destroy something else. It's, yeah, and, and it's I, a lot of money. Yeah. Like it's and the lot. Canadian government too does we, give yeah. some money to Israel. Obviously yeah. not billions, but they give they give money. So it absolutely does concern you. Um tax dollars are funding a genocide, people. Mm. Like you have to understand. People are dying right now. Because they were born in where they were born and because they are who they are and they're being punished for it. <laughs> and over 11,000 people have died now in a month. 5,000 of them children. How can it not concern you? Are you not a human being? Do you not have empathy? for mankind, for humankind? Do you not have empathy for children? When you go and walk and you see a group of kids playing in the schoolyard and recess, all of them together, can you imagine mm. if they were Palestinian? They canceled the 2023-2024 school year in Gaza because all the children died. That's the reality. They literally said, we are canceling our school year, all the children died. How many lives have been cut short? How many potential futures, how many dreams, how many hopes? When I opened up the document, they wrote the names 200 page document of names, 200 pages of people who have been killed so far. The median age of the murdered is 14 years old of those 11,000 people. When I scrolled the pages, it's by age. The first six pages, the age was zero because they had oh. not made it to one year old yet. It concerns all of us. It's inhumane what is happening right now. And when these cowards that we call politicians ask for something called a humanitarian pause, does that not imply that what is happening right now is absolutely inhumane? Mm. Why then ask for a humanitarian pause if what's happening is humane? They know it's inhumane. So people need to wake up We have no time. People are dying. Whatever discomfort you have, whatever, you know, like, get the fuck over it because people are dying. I don't know how else to say it. It's, how long have we been talking now? An hour about? An hour and a half, yeah. hour and a half? Six more children in Gaza died. Mm. That we know of. Mm. There are more men and children, men and women who have died as well. This is a dire situation yeah. that concerns all of us. And if you still don't care or whatever after all of this, I hope you heal and good luck in your life, but you are not um, who I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on the people who want to do something, and whatever's in their control, whatever's in their capacity, just like we're doing right now to raise our voice, to amplify as much as we can, and to make sure that we're, we, to make sure that we're telling people we're not standing for this. Yeah. Whatever our politicians say, whatever they're talking about, whatever nonsense, whatever words they want to use to obfuscate and confuse and blah, 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 we are not with this. 
Yeah. Which is why I'm so happy there are uh, a, a bunch of uh, Jewish advocacy groups who are mobilizing in the United States and who are saying, you are not doing this in our name. Not in our name. You are not doing this for the Jewish people, so you cannot say that this is us. And there have been thousands and thousands of um, organizers who are coming out and saying this, and this is what needs to be done, and this is what needs to continue being done. It involves all of us. And if they can do this in Gaza and get away with it, it will not stop there. Mm. It, they will show up at your doorstep one day. And who will save you then? I found some statistics that I thought were interesting to share. So um, more children have been killed by an Israeli military by the Israeli military in Gaza this month, and that was in the month of October. Then we're killed in armed conflicts globally throughout 2022. 42% of Gaza's housing units have been destroyed by Israeli bombing. 1.4 million Gazans, uh, more than half of the territory's population, have been displaced. For almost 36 hours, 2.3 million people in Gaza were under a near total communications blackout. Families didn't even know if their loved ones were alive. Um, that was, if I may, yeah, I went through that. Yeah, yeah, it was hell. It was yeah. beyond hell not to be able to um, contact my family in Gaza. Um, and they did that deliberately. Mm. And think about it. The Zionist Israeli state cut off telecommunications. Yeah. They have the power to cut off telecommunications. They have the power to cut off the electricity. Do you understand the balance, the imbalance of power here? Usually when there's a war between two countries, usually the, both countries have their own army, army, <laughs> their own grid, their own <laughs> telecommunications. It's not being shut off by the, uh, by the enemy. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, they have power over it. Yeah. They have power over it. So that, those two days were horrendous. Um, I was able to get contact afterwards. But what happened from those two days is that Palestinians in the diaspora outside of Gaza were trying to find ways of how can we not let this happen again? Even if they shut down the telecommunications, what can we do? And that's where the uh, people discovered the e-SIMs, e yeah, which is electronic SIM cards that can be sent with a QR code on your phone and you can install it like without any physical SIM card. And when we confirmed that it was been it does work in Gaza, like with a certain people, that's when we started like the campaign, and that's what we've been doing since. And um, we've raised thousands of eSIMs <laughs> that are being distributed right now to I think over uh, there's like over two thousands that were distributed. Another five thousand are going to be distributed. We're working hard to do this. Meanwhile, the Western media tries to say, Elon Musk might give internet to Gaza or blah, blah, blah. No, don't, it's cap. Do not believe the cap. Palestinians are the ones who are doing the work and who are helping Palestinians during this time. And we need everybody to mobilize and do their part mm. so that we don't go through this again. And there was another tele telecommunications blackout, I think yesterday or the day before, mm -hmm. and we were able to connect with people with the eSIMs. Mm -hmm. And we had journalists who were able to continue reporting because of those eSIMs. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, I, I'm sure everybody at one point thinks, but what can I do? Like, I'm mm -hmm. just, but like, look how collectively when we work together, how much we're able to get done. Now those people are able to communicate with their family, with their loved ones. If anything happens, they're still able to. Do you know how big that is? Yeah. It's huge. And it's truly on your page that I saw that happening. Oh, and I was like, oh my God, oh, that's yeah. so smart. That's so dope. And I, and I saw the impact that it had immediately. I was watching you like post like the screenshots of people in Gaza being like, oh my God, like it works. Like the ism, it's amazing. And you have, and I don't hear about that in the media at all. No, they don't talk about it. Je pense que tu as dit quelque chose de vraiment intéressant par rapport à, like, the what can I do? I think, genre, on vit in a société qui est très, genre, I, I, I. But the thing with, like, the revolution, it's a we problem. 100%. Fait que t'es pas supposé de, like, trouver là, ta solution tout seul in your room. You're, like, you're literally not. So, 
it's important to not only like follow um, Palestinians and like listen to Palestinian voice, but it's just like you can show up. There's there's been so many things in Montreal happening, mm -hmm. and show up and like when you see like other people showing up and other people asking questions you're less alone it's just that and it motivates you it, it motivates you it's like you're not supposed to find you're not supposed to find it you're not supposed to oh what can I do you alone nothing mm -hmm. but like in a group collectively collectively we can move mountains and everyone has a strength like everyone can do something like you know like more, some people are great at like going out to protests and really mobilizing the people and you know other people are better like behind the scenes they don't want to go out to big mm -hmm. groups but they're better at like uh doing fundraisers they're better at doing mutual aid other people are are really good like at uh social media like and and uh, amplifying voices of people everyone has a part to play it, at the very least you can look at the companies that Um, we're asking you to boycott. At you the were, very at, least. At the very least. That's no. bare minimum. But people <laughs> you know? are not even doing that. It's crazy. At the, at the very least, you know, like when McDonald's sends Happy Meals or whatever <laughs> to uh, the soldiers over there who have their full face of makeup and their nails like totally done and apparently they're fighting a war. Um, yeah, that's McDonald's supporting genocide. Mm -hmm. Straight up. So put down the Big Mac and like, I don't know, go to Burger King. Like we live, yeah. we live, we literally live at the end of the day, we're spoiled for choice. We live in a capitalistic society. There's really, you can go to so many other places other than McDonald's and Starbucks mm -hmm. at the very least understand the power that um, your money has because that's all they care about really. Mm -hmm. And if you stop spending your money in certain places, they'll start paying attention. And so. also about the money, just, Précisé que comme, guys, it's not a two weeks like boycott. Right? Like, just focus for plus than like two weeks. <laughs> yeah. It's the boycott, it's meant to be long. Mm -hmm. Like, organizing a revolution, it's long. It's not, it's not like, okay, on était focus pendant un mois. Like, no, bravo. This, is, this needs it's, to be sustained. It's the it's, only way that this will lead to, like, not right now, I feel like it's catching which is good, but for it to really catch fire and become like, it needs to sustain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really needs to be sustained. Um, I think that it started, like this revolutionary sort of bubbling inside of us started with the protests in 2020 with George Floyd yeah. and everything. And I think that, um, I think leaders thought it was extinct. I think they are like, oh, they forgot about it, whatever. But I think there was still like a little spark in there. And I think this... To be it's quite like, honest, me too. I thought it was. I thought it was his instinct. Cause, like I didn't yeah. have much hope. I was like, people forgot. But I it's like, like <laughs> you know, it's like a fire. It's like a roaring fire, and uh, towards the end of the night, like it's small, but yeah. it's still there. And I think that's what happened. They thought it was done, but with what's happening right now, it's kind of getting bigger and bigger again. And I just want that fire to keep roaring and to mm. really um, spark all over the world. I just want. People, are people to be free yeah so guys honestly the bare minimum you can do is not go to starbucks and, and not go to mcdonald's and christmas is coming so like, they, they, they're christmas gonna drinks, have yeah let it go you, we I'm don't like, care the red cup we don't, <laughs> we don't care, care. I'm, not, don't I'm, care. Not, i'm not like a big starbucks avid but like beck and i it's like we you cut us and it's bleeding McDonald's. big mac like, <laughs> and we haven't you know like good we, after yeah. every episode that's like our ritual like we yeah, head to we, mcdonald's like and so we're true. not gonna do that like i do you know You know what I mean? And it's like, That's it's real. okay. It's okay. Like you don't. And also guys, um, please refrain from purchasing like the latest iPhone. If your phone is okay and stand in solidarity, solidarity with the people of Congo as well. Mm -hmm. We caught that as well. A hundred percent. To conclude, I wanted to ask you, what does a free Palestine look um, for you? Like what would it mean for you and the world? It's a big for the philosophical question <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think it's important like when we talk about abolition on parle souvent de dismantle the system mm -hmm. and like breaking things and stuff but we on imagine pas beaucoup i feel like what do i want it to look like so a free palestine to me is undeniably linked to an end of 
obviously the occupation, uh, the, sie- the siege on Gaza. Beyond that, it would be the end of U.S.-led imperialism all over the globe. And as an Afro-Palestinian, I feel like I cannot say that, rather let me put it this way, what I can say is that a free Palestine means a free Congo and a free Sudan and a free Haiti and a free West Sahara and a free Tigray and a free... Our liberty is linked, and to me, a free Palestine means a world that's free from the shackles of imperialism and capitalism. Mm -hmm. Where the millions of Palestinian refugees and descendants can go back to Palestine and see their loved ones and travel freely and live openly and not have to think of how am I gonna survive? And that means for all of us. None of us should have to work to eat. None of us should have to work for a roof over our heads. It should be a given. None of us should go hungry. So for me, a free Palestine means freedom from the system that we currently live in. Mm. That's what it means to me. Do you have any last words, anything you want to get off your chest? Well, I think I got a lot of things yeah, off my chest. Did. I need to get that you out. Um, I hope that we can finally see, I think from our conversation, we saw how much uh, politicians and the media do not care about us. I hope we can throw those media channels in the dustbin mm-hmm. where they deserve to be. Uh, I hope the end of the 24-hour news cycle is coming to an end. I I hope that um, people just do not pay attention to these news medias anymore. Don't get your news from there. Go to the source. Go to people, citizen journalism. Look out for individual voices of people who have the experience. Objectivity in journalism does not exist, okay? So when people or Western media say, "We, we strive to remain objective, no. What they're saying is that they're so far removed from the experience that they don't feel any particular way about it. That's neutrality. And neutrality kills. Mm. Mm. Don't be neutral. Yeah. That's what I want to say. And also, one last thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, today's my cousin's birthday in Gaza. Mm. So I want to say, Sana halwa ya gamil, al miya. بحبك كتير وإن شاء الله نشوف بعض بفلسطين حرة which basically means happy birthday to you I hope you live to be a hundred and I hope we meet again in a free Palestine that was beautiful really um, Sama once again we thank you so much we know that you took time out of a very crazy time to do this we're super grateful um your voice is so necessary. We, um, we're we so happy that you trust our platform to be able to come and do this. Um, we're, incredibly, we're incredibly appreciative and we're just glad that we are able to to use our platform to do this as well. I'm happy that you feel like safe enough mm. to come and say what you had on your chest because that's, to be honest, that's, the only thing that we wanted um and yeah no that's really it i'm really grateful for everything that you said i'm really grateful for you naming names oh yeah uh so tell and i will continue to name names you know make- 15 years ago i wouldn't maybe would not have done this but um i no longer aspire to a career the same way that I did 15 years ago, Mm. where in the sense that I have to, um, you know, forget my ethics in in order to gain this so-called career. No. All I inherited from my parents were my ethics, and that is what I'm going to carry forward with me. 
Thank you. Period. And, and yeah. we, I just want to let you guys know, um, obviously, um, Sama has named all of the Western news channels. We're going to make sure to link the actual journalists that you should we, be uh, listening to, you should be watching. We're going to get Sama's references and also the ones that we've been following. We're going to add all of that um, so you guys know where to get your information because, again, we are in a sea of just Western propaganda. We have to dig and find Palestinian voices and uh, we're going to make sure to link that for you guys and that to neutrality i think that was 100 yeah, percent. yeah. <laughs> yes so um on that note i'm tt and i'm big and we're what the kids call woke or whatever ah, hey guys i'm tt and i'm big and we're what the kids call woke or whatever make sure to like comment and subscribe and turn on the bell notification to not miss any new content